I wish to say thank you, my fine brethren, for this introduction. I could have no more liberty and feel no more at home than if I was in my own pulpit at home. God bless you. I'm here for the purpose to cut my singing is yours to help for all we can for the kingdom of God to catch every soul that's straying away from God. Uh, sir, thank you for that and trust that you'll be praying for me as I minister. And there's nothing any better than a good background when you're ministering to the people all in the Amen. Good evening, friends. So happy to be here again tonight in this big auditorium of this livestock uh, exhibition place here. I think this is about my third time to be here, and each time has always proven such a blessing to be here, and to meet the people here of California. I bring to you tonight uh, great uh, wishes and blessings from the Eastern Brethren and the Church in the East to say to you that they are faring well under God's great provision and trusting that God will give you all a great meeting while we're here together on the West Coast. I wish to thank my brethren here for this great privilege of sponsoring the meeting here as I felt that once more before going overseas, it would be a great privilege to me to visit my friends up and down this West Coast. And we're here tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus to minister and to do all that we can to help everybody to know him better than what they do now. <clears throat> I hope that when the meeting's over, I know him a lot better than I do now, because each day we're all living for that purpose, to try to, to know him a little better. You know, um, someone said to me not long ago, I was speaking on something, and my grammar's pretty poor anyhow, and so uh, someone said, as a great theologian to begin with, he said, you just don't know your Bible. I said, but I know the author real well. <laughs> That's a, to know him is life. And if he be the author of the word, he'll always back up his word to be true. I believe that. And there's much that he can do and does do that's not written in the Bible, but as long as I see it just unfolding in the pages, I, I feel that... Um, what would you call it, that assurance, you know, that everything's running all right because it just looks like it's running right through the pages, so that makes it makes us feel better. <clears throat> we are on a road now up towards Anchorage, Alaska, up the west coast, beginning here in California, just come from Green Lake, Wisconsin, where the full gospel businessman, that the last two times being here, I was with them, and we had the the original convention and uh, Green, I believe it was Green Lake, Wisconsin, and then we came down to Chicago for some fellowship there with the Christians. Had a wonderful time, great gathering, many people, and the Lord blessed us together on our feeble efforts of trying to minister to his people. And then from there we went from there over to Southern Pines, North Carolina. I always want to call that Southern Pines or be South Carolina. But it's in North Carolina, and we certainly had a time of fellowship there with the Convention of the Interdenominational Brotherhood. Such a wonderful time. And then on from that down into to, uh, South Carolina to Columbia, and there we met the people and knowing that we were coming here to the West Coast, all oh, sojourning there, as we all are pilgrims, who profess this great hope that we have in Christ. We do not profess this to be our home. We are pilgrims and strangers. We are seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. That was Abraham's attitude. He was looking for a city. And we are the children of Abraham. Being in Christ, we are Abraham's seed. Of course, we know that Isaac was the natural seed. And the natural seed all look for that city. How much more should the royal seed look for? The royal seed of Abraham. And I believe the church today, the call out, is the royal seat of Abraham. We are professing that this is not our home, for 
We have no anchor here on earth. And if we have, I trust we've cut it loose right quick so that if he would come tonight, we'd be taken up, not anchored down to the earth. So thankful for this opportunity. And now I know it gets a little late so quick. So much to be said. It seems like such a little time to say it in. But it makes you kind of been nervous like the whole world under a pressure trying to hurry and do something. But I trust that we'll not do that during a time of this campaign, that we'll just be like we used to be a long time ago. Just kind of let off the pressure and let down and just be ourselves. You know, just, just be Christians and fellowship one with another and while the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all uncleanness. And now, I also come to throw my net in with these brethren. Now, you know, each one of us are fishermen. You know, there's the Lord told a fisherman one time, he said, to follow him and be fishers of man. And that's what's here on the platform tonight, is fishers of man. We stand on a corner somewhere in our church, we cast out the net through the neighborhood and gather with all that we can, bringing in every sinner, no matter what position he's in, we try to bring him to Christ. Well then, there comes a time when we want to reach a way out. So we put all of our nets together <laughs> so we can go way out and get a big race. And that's what we're here for tonight. And I've just knitted my net and the fellowship of love around my brethren and their nets the same way out through Los Angeles and around and see how many souls we can get in for Christ. And that's the purpose of being here. Now, we, of course, we know in the saining you get everything coming, but there's some there that's going to be fixed as sure as the world. And God will take them. Now, you pray for me uh, as I speak and pray for the sick. And I'm not a healer. I've been called that, but I'm not. I'm your brother. Just, just your brother here praying for the sick. And uh, so I know that testimonies give a great push. And just something happened last night or next to the last night in Columbia made some news up in the country there that they couldn't get the little baby in a prayer line. It was a waterhead child, little face narrow and his head way out, looked to be about a year or two old, and his eyes were done, you know, how they do, and great veins in his head, and the doctors, uh, earthly physicians, had to give it shots every day to keep it alive. And... Um, they couldn't get the little fellow in, so they had it behind the curtain, and I went back to pray for it because they pray for him as he comes with prayer cards and gets the cards, and they give them out each day. And so the little fellow didn't have a card, and the mother could not stay no longer than that one night. So we prayed for the little fellow behind the platform, and the next morning it was a astounding thing. All those big veins was gone, and his little head was practically normal. So they, they, they took it down to the doctor, not saying anything, and the physician looked it over and examined something in his blood. They had to take these shots, and he said, the child don't even need any shots. He said, I have never seen anything like this before. And um, so it just made a great rumor through the neighborhood, and as it was in the Bible times, it was spread abroad everywhere. Uh, the love and fame of our Lord Jesus, how he still can heal the sick, regardless of what it is, he still can heal it. it he's, he has the power has been deposited in the box and has given us each a key, that's his name. And if we're not afraid to sign it, well, he'll, certainly endure, he'll certainly make the check good when it arrives as he's got his name behind it. Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it, he said. And I believe that. Whatever you ask in his name, believing you receive it, you shall do it. Now, I think tomorrow morning is the ministerial breakfast, I think. I'm always happy for those that get to meet my brethren. I'm looking forward to seeing your brethren tomorrow morning at the breakfast. And I suppose if the business man here but may have the, the Saturday morning, is that official now? Saturday morning at Clifton. Well, I get some more of that good porridge to have down there. Man, that's really good. I, I like that. So we'll be looking far up there to see you up there. Now, 
been a lot of water has went over the dam since this, that's a southern expression since we met before. Some pretty near getting killed recently by a gun exploding. You see it across my face. And, but the Lord spared my life, and I'm, I'm thankful to be here. I was shooting a gun that had been rebored by Mr. Weatherby up here, and it had been given to me as all right, and I shot it a couple times and noticed it swelling around the ring and put another shell in, and they don't know yet what happened. The gun exploded and blowed the barrel 50 yards ahead of me. And, loads of pieces of the gun through the trees, and all I see is this red fire fly up. And when they they thought I'd, of course, the pieces stuck into my skull, and just 15 pieces went just below the sight of my eye, and one went through here and knocked the top of the tooth off and cut me through the face. And when they, I didn't know where I was at for a few minutes, of course, and I couldn't see. And it was like it threw hamburger in my face about four weeks ago. And I pulled this eye up, and I See, look around, I seen the man that went down there with me at the range where I shoot this target shooting. He was going out to the target, and I couldn't hear, couldn't speak, couldn't hear, or see. And finally I got his attention. He came up there, and I stopped the blood with my hand, and we prayed, and the blood all stopped, and I soaked all over. And they take me over to the doctor, and he said, Oh, my. I forget how many tons of pressure. They said that gun would stand... That when the man come up and found you, he used to just have found the legs down here and no head or shoulders that burst that seal. It should have rolled the whole body up. It's just that close to my eye when it went off. So I'm thankful to be here. <laughs> Very grateful. And the physician that looked at the place, he said, well, there's only one. So there's nothing to be done, he said, because the seal went all the way back in the eye and said, never touched the sight. And said, the only thing that I know that can say the good Lord must have been sitting on the bench to protect his servant that morning. Or he wouldn't have. So I feel that, that he kept me here to minister to you and to help you, and you helped me, and we're all here together to help each other. And now we want to turn to his word. I just love his word. And it, it's a little, we always, on the first night, get a little late start, but we hope to get away on time. and. We we'll try to pray for some sick people. Billy told me he gave out some cards, and and now if we don't get them all in tonight, just hold them. We'll get them, and don't be in a hurry. And now let's uh, before we read his word, let's just speak to him just a moment by prayer as we bow our heads and our trust that our hearts will be bowed also. Now. As you have your head bowed, your eyes closed, and your heart centered towards God, I just wonder if there's any request would like to be remembered. Just raise up your hands, and by that you're saying, God, you know what I have need of now tonight. God bless. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we are now approaching thy throne of grace. We would not desire to stand by the throne of justice because we would not feel that we could stand there. But when we come by the way of grace, you bid us to come, and we are so happy that we have the privilege of approaching thee, the great and mighty Jehovah, in the way of the grace of Jesus Christ. Now we come in his name, knowing that he said that Wherever two or more are assembled in my name, then I'll be in the midst of them. And again, he said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, it will be granted. And we have the assurance now, Lord, that by these precious promises of the Word of God that you are here to listen. And Father, first we would say, forgive us of our trespasses as we have forgive others that trespass against us. And we pray, Lord, that you'll lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may the kingdom of God come down upon us and bless our gathering together, bless the reading of the word, and do all things, Lord, to the glory of thy kingdom. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, you that like to kind of take down a little text, I'd like for you to read with me tonight in St. Matthew 14, beginning with the 22nd verse, for just a few moments, if you'll bear with me. 
And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he would sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the waves were contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But Jesus straightway, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of a good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. I want to use this tonight as a form of a testimony meeting. Must have been around about the time the sun was going down. And it had been an awful day. There had been much activity in the services that day. There seen some terrific things happening. And all along, when you're in the presence of Christ, you always see the miraculous things taking place. That's the reason I love to live in his presence, is to see his great tender hands going out to minister. I would have loved to have walked with him in those days. But I think today it's maybe a greater privilege because he's walking inside of us. Then he was on the outside pointing. Now he's on the inside pointing to himself what he's doing. And I'm so glad for the privilege. Now, the, the, I would think maybe it was a, one of the larger men of the group we call him Simon, maybe, that had been one of the converts to the Lord Jesus was pushing the boat off of the bank where they'd pulled it up after they'd been journeying and preaching along the coast. And, and the day had been hot. He was tired and he pushed the boat out into the water and climbed in, sat down by the side of his brother Andrew and picked up the oars and the little ship. Now the ships of those days wasn't like the ships of today. They wasn't propelled by jet or by electrical power. They were pulled by hand. Many of them kind of like a, a, a fisherman's boat today. They had long oars. And there would be a man on one side with the oar, right across from him would be another man. Then they had a sail when the wind was right, that hossed up this sail and catch the wind and, and uh, would blow them uh, to their place's destination where they were determined to go. And then if the wind wasn't very good, they would pick up the oar. And there'd be two men in each seat pulling on the oar. And I can see Simon as he climbs into the boat, great strong-looking fella, perhaps bald-headed, and sets down by the side of a, his brother Andrew, picked up the oar, then make a couple of strokes, and then wave back. And the people standing on the bank waving at them. Quite a dramatic sight, because they were bidding them come back. There's something, you know, when you meet up with people that you have things in common. Your talk is common. Your fellowship then becomes wonderful when you can have things in common. That's why we are here tonight, because we've got things in common. We like to talk with each other. We talk about the same things, and uh, that's the way they were. They had been talking that day and about God and about his great power and seeing his power working among them. And the meeting was over, and they were going home or across the other side of the lake for the next campaign. And I can imagine how their hearts felt as they waved goodbye to those precious people of that day after they had fellowship around the great works of Christ. Now, what a blessed time it is, how you hate to leave one another. It's a love that it happens in the heart. It's too bad that much of that is missing today in our gathering, is that real love that the church should have one for another. 
In the early days of my ministry, I pastored a church, and we used to get together at night in a little homemade way and put our hands together, and we'd sing that song, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred mind is like to that above. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Many of those precious old faces are done in the presence of God. And that song still echoes down in my soul that we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. I've helped direct tombstones over many of their graves and seen them throw the dirt back in when I return the body, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But just our heart to dust return us was not spoken of the soul. That's right. It's gone on in the presence of God. That fellowship, something in ministering brethren would come in and say, How's it done, Brother Branham? We would just couldn't hardly get away from each other. We just wanted to shake hands again. And sometimes we would just walk out to the car and pat one another on the shoulders, just not as a makeup, a put on, but something that was really coming from our hearts. I just wished all the church of the living God could feel that way about it tonight. We just be in such a grand unity for the coming of the Lord, which I believe is near at hand now. I believe we're living in the very shadows of it. And if he doesn't come today, I'll be looking for him tomorrow. And if he doesn't come this year, I'll be looking for him next year. Just whenever I want to be looking every minute for him coming, carrying on, just doing what I can, but still believing that he's coming any time, being prepared for it. And I think the preparation of the church should stand in that status at all times, that we should certainly be watching for the coming of the Lord. And now, as such fellowship had been enjoyed, these disciples going out at sea now are going across the lake. I'd imagine the sun set about like it did this afternoon, beautiful out across the sea. And the water was calm, and they'd make a couple of strokes with their oars and stand up and wave goodbye and I'm on the bank waving goodbye. Come back to see us again and and as the little boat pulled out, dimmer and dimmer the little line got on the bank of the people waving and finally they disappeared. They made a pull for quite a while and and working up kind of a sweat, you know, when you're pulling those big heavy oars. Many of you people who pull boats know what that means. And after it must have been young John who kind of give out first, you know, being a young fellow might have stopped and wiped the perspiration off his forehead and said, What do you say, brethren? Let's stop for a few minutes and catch a little breath as they are uh, being young. And so they pull their oars in. As they coast a little bit, he said, Why not have a testimony meeting while we're waiting here to rest up a little? And, um, and you know, it's kind of, when you got a lot of things on your heart and you just can't keep it still, you've got to say something about it. And so I'd imagine that young fellow just something boiling down in him. He had seen something that day that had convinced him. And a man, when he's thoroughly convinced of anything, he can't hold his feet. That's all. He's just got to do something about it. And when the church becomes thoroughly convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's here present with us today in the form of the Spirit, I'm telling you there's going to be a revival strike the land that will burn the nation up. When all church members are fully convinced, but they have to be convinced first before they can be sincere about it. So young John said, we'll start a testimony meeting while we're waiting. I'd like to be the first one to testify, because we're just burning in him. Huh? Remember, a sister used to be in our church. She'd sing a little song, something, I forget how she, what she called it, but something around, running, 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 and can't stand still, or something like that. It just got over and can't stand still, or something. But she was, certainly had a, a real jubilee all to herself with it, whether the rest of them did or not. But she was having a great time with it. So that must have been the condition that John was in. And let's just stop now and listen and testify. John said, Brethren, there's one thing that I'm thoroughly convinced in. 
We can tell the world from today on that we're not following some kind of a whack. We're not following some false prophet, some puffed up something that knows nothing, but we're following God. We're not following some false prophet. I can call back the days when I was a little boy. I used to play in the springtime on the hillside. And I remember my pretty Jewish mother used to call me in and, and set me on the porch that looked out towards the garden, rocked me to sleep in her arms, and she would tell me the Bible stories, and she showed me where Joshua, the great warrior, crossed the river under the power of Jehovah and rolled back the waters, and in the springtime the big muddy flood stood still while our people crossed into their own grounds, in their own land. When they come up from slaves out of another country, been down there living like slaves, and now they've been brought into their own country. And she told me how that God provided for them in their journey, how that for 40 years out there in the wilderness without failing one time, God put bread down out of heaven upon the earth every night for them to get it fresh every day. And I used to say as a little boy, Mama, it's a strange thing. I do not understand how God does that. Does he have a night shift working up there and the heavens is all full of bakeries that he bakes the bread and the angels bakes it and runs down the ladder and spreads all the ground for his children? I remember I'd ask Mama that. And she would say to me, my little boy John, of course you understand as a child, but you know, Jehovah don't have to do those kind of things. Jehovah is a creator. He doesn't have to have ovens and bake bread and go through the procedure that we do, but he is a creator. And all he has to do is just speak the word, and the bread is there. Hallelujah. And brethren, today when, when Andrew went down there and got that five little biscuits from that little boy that was playing truant from school, and gave us that lunch, and when I saw him take that bread and break it, and feed 5,000 people, I know that wasn't a false prophet. There's some connection there with God because God alone can do it. It must have been God. And did you notice he just looked like Jehovah when he stood there, picking up that bread? And you know, I slipped around behind the rock and got up above and looked over. And I said, I wonder where he's getting it. And he picked up this biscuit and when he broke the biscuit, and I watched the end of it, and he handed it out to one of you brothers. When his hand started back, there was the same biscuit again, ho. So he, he didn't have to, to bake it anymore. It was created right in his hand. So it must have been Jehovah. And uh, for he was a creator, I've seen the way he acted, it was Jehovah, I know it is. And he's not nothing false. And I'm thoroughly convinced. And that little boy, how I noticed his little eyes as he looked up. Now you see, to the little boy here tonight, that little boy was going, maybe going fishing, or he might have been on his road to school, but when he, when he seen that crowd, he... Like any little boy, he'd run up as a spectator to see what was going on. But one time he heard the voice of Jesus, that, that was better than going fishing. He, he wanted to listen to what was said. Then they asked if there's anything to eat, and he only had his two little fish and five biscuits. And so then it, it wasn't very much in the little boy's hand. But when he let Jesus have it, look what it did. And now that's what it is. Our lives are not very much as long as we handle it ourselves, but once in the hands of the Creator, how you can take what little we got and press it out and feed the multitude. 
And you just remember that. When you hear Jesus speaking in your heart, just surrender all you've got to him, and he'll go to multiplying it and feeding the others by your testimony and whatever you have to give him. He'll bless it. So when John got through with his testimony, he could no more than hardly get set down until this great brawny back fisherman called Peter raised up in the boat, looked over to Andrew and said, I remember when my brother Andrew went to hear John. He told me that he was speaking of a Messiah coming. So I thought it was just another rumor crossing the country. It's just somebody as it has been coming and going. So, you know, Andrew come in one day thoroughly convinced that this was the Messiah, so he called me to go with him down to listen at him one morning. So uh, I told him I would go here once because I had made up in my mind that if it was the Messiah, I would know him because I wasn't going to approach him by any silly idea. I was going to approach it, the subject, by the Scripture. And it had to be by the Bible. And Andrew, you're my brother, can well remember our old gray-headed father when he set me on the boat one day after we would almost out of bread at home and the barrel was about empty and the crew's dry and we couldn't catch no fish. And that morning, uh, while we gathered around, we had some debts to pay and we prayed, God, give us a good catch today. And Andrew, you're aware of how we prayed of those things and how Dad taught us. And that day we had a marvelous catch, enough to pay off all the debts and get us something to eat for the day. And that day, Dad took me by the hand and he said, Simon, my boy, I have taught you the things that's right. All my days I've longed to see that coming Messiah. I believe that I would see him, but it's seemingly now that I'm old and I'm perhaps won't be able to see him. And, but you'll probably see him in your days. We've looked for him through the generations to come since the very beginning of time. But someday, Simon, he will arrive. Yes. And if he doesn't come in my generation, he may come in yours because he's a promise of God. I like that. God's promise cannot fail. Right. The word is positive. It cannot change. It must say just the way it's written. God will judge the world someday. And the world will have to have a standard. And if the church is a standard, which is, where is the church? There's hundreds of different organizations of them. But the standard that God will judge it by is by his word. I believe the word. Yes. Or in the book of Revelation, it's written, Whosoever shall add one thing to or take anything out, the same will be taken out from the part of the book of life for him. So I believe that this word is just what it is. It's just God's word. And I'm going to make this grand old Pharisee tonight uh, believe that same thing when he said, Simon... There will be all kinds of false things rise up as, along to the age as you live to be an old man, I hope. But when that Messiah comes, Simon, I'll tell you what he'll be. He'll be just exactly what the Scripture says he'll be. Now, Moses, our prophet, has said to us in our, our scroll on Deuteronomy that the Lord your God shall raise up from among you a prophet like me. Now, Simon, you'll know him because he'll be a prophet, and you'll, be, you'll recognize him by that because the Scripture says he must be a prophet. So you'll find lots of things going on, but this man will be a prophet. And besides, we Jews know that the Word of God comes to the prophet. That's exactly what the Scripture says, the Word of the Lord came to the prophet. And so the, the prophet was to come. Now, don't you forget that, Simon, he told me. And almost in his dying words, he told me, Son, don't forget. Remember when he arrived?
Christ, he'll be a prophet like unto Moses. Because that's exactly what it says. And how you'll know he'll be a prophet? Because Moses has told us, and the scriptures tell us, that if there be one among you who's spiritual or prophet, and what he says comes to pass in hearing. Yes. But if he doesn't come to pass, then don't fear him. Yes. Because the word of the Lord is not with him. Yes. Because God cannot lie. God has to be truth. And if the man tells it and it comes to pass, then it's, it wasn't the man, it was God. And so that's the way you'll know him. And you know, when I went down that day, I kind of doubted Andrew, and I imagine him shaking his shoulders like that. said, I kind of doubted my brother Andrew. I thought it was just something else. But when I walked up in the meeting that morning, Andrew got there much earlier than I was because I had to finish the net, uh, bending the net. And when I come into the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, looked right straight at me and he said, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas. Not only did he know who I was, he knew that godly old father of mine. Yeah. He said, That settled it for me. Uh, I know right then that that was him. That was the prophet that Moses had spoke of. That convinced me that it was that. He had no more than got through talking to Philip, jumped up and said, Just a minute, brethren. Oh, I just can't hold any morning. Turned around, looked at the front of the boat, and said, Nathaniel, do you forgive me? Why, sure, brother Philip. It's only a privilege for you to hear you testify. Now, Nathaniel and I were boys together. We grew up. We went to the same synagogue. We sat in the same pews. We, we, were, we were boys together. And we both studied the scriptures very plainly. I was standing there that day when I seen him and heard him tell Simon about his daddy and about him. And I was so thrilled and we had both agreed that when the Messiah come, he had to be a scriptural Messiah. He had to be a scriptural Messiah. So I took off running as hard as I could. And, and, and Nathaniel, I never forget the morning I knocked on the door over there. I almost run day and night to get there. And I knocked on the door and your wife said, he's out in his grove. And I went out there and you were praying and I heard you in your prayer saying, oh God, we have waited so long. But we believe that the hour will approach. That when we shall see the Deliverer, we are looking for him at any time. And God, I am here this morning because something strange struck me last evening. I had a dream that I saw him. And I, I'm here this morning praying. And as soon as he got up, well, Philip said, Come see who we have found, the Messiah. We found he that was spoke of by Moses and the prophet uh, Jesus yeah. of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Uh, he didn't uh, stop to ask how the orchard was getting along. The, he was thoroughly convinced. That's what's the trouble today. We have so much other stuff that we pack along that it seems like we're not exactly convinced. So if we're convinced, it's right straight to the point. Believe it. Oh, I'll come into Brother Robert's meeting. I'll be prayed for. If I miss it there, I'll go over to Brother Allen's meeting. If I miss it there, I'll catch Brother Bramsey. It's not. Don't do that. Be convinced that he's God and believe it. That his word is right and settled it right there. Perfectly satisfied. There's nothing in we man. We're man. If he's the one that died, he's the one. Yeah, that raised again. And to lie forevermore. Uh, For mortal beings, his representatives, we, we die, man, but he cannot die. He's the immortal one. Now, and Philip went right straight to this point and said, Come see, we found him. And Nathaniel, do you remember that hot flash that passed through you? You thought, what had happened to me? Surely I'd went off on a deep end somewhere. Why, you said... Philip, what's happened to you? Why, if the Messiah would come, he would walk right down the corners of heaven, come right down to our, our own group, and he would 
speak right straight to our own group of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and be out of it all together. So there would be nothing else to it. Well, and he had come right up to the temple, to the headquarters, and, and there he would make himself known to Caiaphas or high priest, and that would settle it. But you know, God does things in his own way. He's got a way of doing it. He always has things like that. That he does it. He, he's God. And he, he works as God. He, he serves as God because he's the immortal, infinite. How can our little finite mind ever reach out there to that infinite mind of God? Oh, he's uh, omnipresent, omniscient. He, he's God. And there, when he said, I never wasted any words with, with Nathaniel, I said, come and see. That's a good idea. Don't stay home and criticize. Come find out for yourself. That's the best way. Search the scriptures, Jesus said. For in them you think they have, you have everlasting life, and they are they that testify of me. In other words, if I, if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do the works and you can't believe me, believe the works. For the works is what testifies of the testimony. You can testimony, but the works that you do in the life that you live speaks louder than all the testimony that you could give. So the work speaks louder than the testimony. He said, believe the word that I do. And if I don't do the works of God, then don't believe me. But if I do the works, then if you can't believe me as being God, then believe the works that I do. Now, notice, he never taking credit to himself. He said, it's not me, it's the Father that dwells in me. He doeth the work. How we find that Nathaniel going along the bank with, with Philip and... You know, Philip might have started a testimony like this. He said, Do you remember that, uh, Simon, the fisherman, that man that doesn't have any education? Yes, I remember. I know his father, Jonas. Yes. Remember you bought some fish from him one time? He couldn't sign the receipt? Yes, I remember that well. Well, Andrew, his brother, was a believer on the Messiah and told him, like you and I have taught, that the Messiah will be a prophet like Moses. That's the scriptural approach to him. And now, if it is him, then here's what happened. When he came up in the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus told him who he was. He said, your name is Simon, and you're the son of Jonas. And you know what, Nathaniel? It wouldn't surprise me if he didn't tell you who you were when you come. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Nathaniel said, well, Philip, I'm not going to be critical. I'm just going to find out. Well, when we arrived at the meeting, there might have been a prayer line. Or they might have been sitting out in the audience or wherever it was or standing up. Somehow, there was a group of Pharisees around there. And they know how they were orthodox. But they didn't believe in the supernatural. So they, they were standing with their hands behind them, and they seen Jesus performing these signs, and they know they had to answer to their congregation. And they couldn't say it wasn't done because it was right before the congregation. So they said, he's Beelzebub. He is the prince of the devil. That's what, he, in other words, a foul spirit doing that, a devil, a fortune teller, or some other... Uh, foul spirit. We all know that fortune telling and that stuff is of the devil. And so as they called the spirit that was in Christ an unclean spirit, and he told him, said, I forgive you for that, but someday the Holy Ghost is coming. He'll do the same thing. And to speak a word against that will never be forgiven in this world nor the world to come. So wonder if we could be living in that day. Anyhow, we find out that when they come up into the, where the people were, Jesus looked straight around into the crowds, or maybe Nathaniel might have stepped in the line somewhere, and Jesus looked at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. He never told him who he was, but he said, An Israelite in whom there is no God. He said, Rabbi, which means teacher, master, when did you ever know me? 
Uh, I'm a stranger to you, in other words. When did you ever know me? Here comes the quail, come back. He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. I can imagine old Nathaniel raising up in there a little bit and shaking his hands and shouting a little bit and dancing around the boat. And it might have been Matthew said, Set still and you'll turn the boat over. <laughs> oh, they were getting up and uh, having them a real jubilee then, a real testimony meeting. Don't you like to get into those? Just having a glorious time. Said, Oh, set still, brother, you turn the boat over. Oh, well, I remember. That sure took all the starch out of me. But Philip and I had just been discussing that scripture. If there was one among us that was a prophet, and we hadn't had a prophet for 400 years. And since um, uh, Malachi, 400 years before, the idea of prophet had faded out. But when that strange man told me what I was before I even come over there, that settled it with me. I looked, and I looked around and I seen the, my uh, bishop, or whatever you might call him, up there, a priest standing up there, and he gave me a great pound because, you know, I used to be deacon over there, and so he gave me a great pound, but I was convinced. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I knew that was him, so I didn't turn my back and rushed over to him and pulled out of his feet and said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, I can hear him and say, excuse me, Philip. I just couldn't let you go ahead. I just had to tell it myself. See? When it happens to you, you like to tell it yourself. That's, that's it. There's something about it. You get the joy out of it. And what a testimony. And Andrew just trying to get up and trying to hold him down, you know. He said, me that. That's his young. He said, brethren, let me give a testimony for all of us. You remember the day when he told us he was going down to Jericho? Yes, I remember the Going down to Jericho. And how it... He need to uh, go by Samaria. How we wondered in our hearts, what's he going to wear around Samaria for instead of going right down to Jericho? But he said he had need to go by. One of them said, yeah, sure. I remember, you remember down at the pool of Bethesda that day when that man was healed laying there and that great multitude of people? And he said over there, very, very, I say unto you, the son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the father doing. It must have been that he was led to go up around there. And we wondered why he would go up to those Samaritans. Then we came to Sychar, and we, he sat down like he was tired, and he said, go on into the city and get something to eat for us. And we slipped in, and you remember and what, how we, what happened? And on our road back, we were surprised to see this woman, marked of ill fame. You know what I mean. Them days where they had to be marked if they were... They were bad women. So uh, they um, said, we saw that woman and our master talking to her. What a strange thing, our pastor talking to a woman like that. And there she was standing there with, with all of her curls fixed up on her head, and, and she had this pot of water, and uh, going to get some water, she started to let it down. Well, we said, uh-uh, she's not one of our race. He already tell her off. And look, she's marked. Let's see what he's going to say to her, because she's no good. You can see the, her marks she wears, and uh, she's branded. So, um, and she don't even belong to our congregations at all. She's not even our race of people. So he'll really tell it to her. You just watch and see. And we sit up behind the bushes and listen real close. And time and I couldn't make you keep your head down. So then uh, you just want to look over top of somebody's shoulders. And um, so then we watched a little while, and the woman hooked the hooks into the, the pot, and she uh, uh, started with the window, let it down, and he said, bring me a drink. And she turned, she had she'd never noticed him. Probably she'd been out all night, and she's sleepy, and so she never noticed him sitting there. And he was just a middle-aged Jew. He wasn't a 30 years old, but uh, I think according to Scripture, they said he looked about 50, because he said... Uh, you say that you saw Abraham and you're a man not over 50 years old. So it must have been his ministry wore him a little. You know what he said? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> that little earthly body had nothing to do with it. So he must have looked out like a middle-aged man sitting up against the wall. There. And he said, she said, um, Sir, it's not customary. You don't realize that 
if we have segregation here, that uh, to you being a, uh, a Jew would ask anything of me, a woman of Samaria. Remember what he said? He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, I wonder tonight if we really know what this is that comes out. If we could open our eyes and see angels in their position, see the Holy Spirit, glory to God, ready to do something. If you only knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'd give you waters that you don't come here to draw. And she went ahead and told him about the well. And you remember the conversation about the worship in Jerusalem? And he told her that God was a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we find out that the conversation went on. He said to her, go get your husband and come here. Well, she said, I don't have any husband. And oh, Mark, did I see the look on your face? You said, yes, one time is a slip-up. <laughs> Something wrong here. Because that she's admitting to him, or saying to him, that she doesn't have a husband, and he said she did have a husband. Now, what's going to happen? He said, go get your husband and come here. Sing of her. <laughs> husband. She didn't have one like that. That's true. <laughs> As I said, go get your husband and come here. And she, and, uh, she said, I have no husband. He said, Thou hast said the truth. You well have you said it, because you've had five. And the one you're now living with is not yours. In that thou saidest the truth. And do you remember, said Andrew, the expression on her face? She said, Sir! Not like those priests was down there when they saw it done. They said, He's Beelzebub. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. (laughs) We know, we Samaritans, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? She she introduced him as her, or, or was known to her as a prophet. It had to be a prophet. Never seen her before. How did you know this? Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, watch what she, she was a scripture reader. She was in the Word. She probably know more about it than a lot of other people to have. <laughs> Even now. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet, and we know. That when the Messiah cometh, when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us this kind of stuff. This will be what he'll tell us. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. How those big brown eyes changed. Them pretty curls fell down across her shoulder. She left that old water pot and took to the city as hard as she could go, saying, come see a man that told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very spiritual sign of the Messiah? Isn't that what we've been waiting for? Isn't that the very thing that we know will come? And you remember when we went down into the city, when she, now absolutely she was being, if you know the Eastern custom, she, the man wouldn't listen to her. No, sir, because she was a woman of ill fame. The man won't listen to her. But you try, somebody's really found out about Jesus, I don't care what they was, you try to keep them away from it then. Somebody's going to listen somewhere. You're ever convinced that it's the time thought something somebody's going to listen. Yeah. She was shaking the town with her testimony. Come see a man. She didn't care what she was supposed to say or not. It was burning in her soul. She was convinced that he said it out at the gate. I went out there and he told me my life. This is the very Messiah. Excuse me, I ought to be yelling in that like that if you turn it down. See? Um said, he told me my life. Isn't that the very Messiah? And the man on the testimony of that ill-famed woman, without him doing it one more time, was thoroughly convinced by the woman's testimony that that was the Son of God, that he was Jesus of Nazareth. All the testimony 
how it went on to go on in this testimony me. One of them might have said, you remember that day that that um, Zacchaeus got up in the tree? Remember him testifying down at the meeting and said, I've got it in for him. And I'll climb up this tree down at Jericho. And when he passes by here, he won't see me. I'll pull all the leaves in around me like this and camouflage myself right good. I'll get a good look at him. And he come walking right down the street, stopped right under that tree and looked up. Not only did he see him behind those leaves, but he knew who he was. He said, Back up! Hallelujah! Come down! I'm going home with you for dinner today. One of them might have raised up, might have been Matthew, and said, the same one that wrote this story tonight, said, Brethren, do you remember also when he come out of Jericho, how that old blind Barney Mayus laying over there in a corner, and all the priests and all of them said, Hey, you here, you raise the dead. We got a graveyard full of them up here. Come raise these. Hey, you false prophet. Use this, that, and her. Some holler and hail the prophet and so forth and others cursing him and so forth. But he had his head set towards Jerusalem to go to be offered up to Calvary. And that poor blind beggar down there and that little Christian woman come by, picked him up. He said, What's, madam, what is it? See, there's something other about a person that's a Christian. They're always willing to help somebody else to find it. I said, what's all of it goes by? She said, are you just a stranger? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet of Galilee. That's the son of David, the one we hope for. And he began to cry out. He said, now, Lord, he's probably too far away, half a block away from me there at the walls. If they spotted out where he, he was sitting and where he was, is more than a half a city block uh, away from him. Like that, maybe right on a hundred yards, and he began to cry down, Son of David, have mercy on me. And somehow or another, he touched the border of his garment. Stop! He said, Bring him here. That's Jesus of Nazareth. What a testimony meeting. Wouldn't you like to have been sitting out there this man? How, oh, brother? The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same Jesus. If you put the life of any vine, as you put the life of a, of a vine uh, going up through the branches, and if it bears forth a branch and it comes forth this kind of a branch and brings this kind of fruit, grapes, if it ever puts forth another branch, it'll bring grapes, just the same. And he is the vine, we are the branches. And the first branch that ever come out of that vine, they wrote a book of Acts behind it. That's right. And if that ever puts forth another vine, they'll write another book of Acts behind it. That's right. Because they'll bring forth the same fruit, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Remember, he performed that sign of the prophet before whom? The Jew and the Samaritan, not the Gentile. Remember, there's only three races, Ham, Sam, and Japheth's people, Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Now, he never performed it one time before a Gentile, as we have record of. Why? Because the Gentiles wasn't looking for no Messiah. That's the reason today they don't see it, yet they're not looking for anything like this. They don't believe the Holy Ghost because they're not looking for such a thing. Amen. All they go is join church and put their name on a book and say that's all there is to it. But to those who are looking for the power, those who are looking for the Holy Spirit, those who are looking for the signs of the Bible to be fulfilled. Now come to pass the Lord says, says God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all the now, there, if he comes to those who are looking for him. Now, I remember, he did that sign to the Jews. They turned it down. He did it to the Samaritans. They accepted it. Now, remember, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, let's just stop for a moment and just take just a moment longer now to get this, because I believe it will drive it down. Feel it. Now, he said, as it was in the days of Lot. Now, notice there's always three classes of people. God is perfected in three. Now, there is a believer, make-believer, and unbeliever. And that's never a congregation. <laughs> a real believer. Now, in the days of Lot, that's just the way they were setting, and that's the same way they're setting right now. Believers, make-believers, and unbelievers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Abraham was the elected church, the believer, who had walked with God. He was a seed, and his seed was going to be uh, inherit the earth, and, and he was the, the great order of God. 
And all that was with him was in order with God. All his servants circumcised and everything. They were waiting for this promised son. Amen. Hallelujah. And they come right up on the hill and they didn't have things as nice as Lot, the make believer, down in Sodom. And the Sodomite was the unbeliever, make believer, and the believer. And coming to Abraham's tent were three angels. One of them remained with Abraham and two went down in Sodom. A modern Billy Graham and so forth, the great evangelists of the day went down there. No miracles, only smote them blind. And preaching the gospel smites the unbeliever blind. That's right. So he went down and preached the gospel and called Lot out. You see the order of the day? But to the church elected Abraham, the real church, that wasn't in Sodom, it was out of Sodom. Out, no fellowship with the world. Called out, celebrated, church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Called out, separated, waiting for the promised son. And the one that stayed behind with him talked with him. And remember a few days before that, his name was Abram. And his, na- his wife's name was Sarah, S-A-R-A. But it had been changed to A-B-E-R-H-A-M, Abraham. And Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, princess. Abraham, father of nations. Now the Bible says this angel had his back turned to the tent. And he had just been eating lamb or a veal chop, drinking milk and eating cornbread. A man dust on his clothes. Entertained by Abraham. And then while he was sitting there, he said, Abraham. Where is thy wife, Sarah? Called him by his, his prince name and her by his princess name. Where is Sarah, thy wife? How did he know his name was Abraham? How did he know his name had been changed, both of them? How did he know he, he was married and had a wife? He said, he's in the tent behind you. And Sarah, he said, I'm going to visit you. Yeah. Well, I, I have a yeah. question for I'm going to visit you according to the promise that you've waited 25 years to receive. Yeah. That son that you've looked for with you is coming. Yeah. According to the time of life, I'll visit you. And Sarah now, both well stricken in age, Abraham, 100 years old, and Sarah, 90, was back there in the tent and she sniggered to herself. We call it, you know, she laughed to herself and said, um, me, an old woman, have pleasure with my Lord and him being old too, Abraham. In other words, as husband and wife, they've probably not been with him for 15, 20 years. See, me have pleasure with my Lord, me old and he old too, both stricken age. It, it shocked her so. She kind of laughed up her sleeve, as we call it. Laughed up her sleeve of that. How could that be? You know what? God would have took her off right then. That's right. Or disbelieving him. But he couldn't do it. Why? Wow. She's a part of Abraham. He didn't have to take Abraham with it. Oh, that's where grace comes in. All the mistakes in her error, God holds us because we're a part of Christ. The grace of God on his own. Hallelujah. Oh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. He could not take Sarah because he did it. Strike Abraham with it. He cannot take the church. And all of his mistakes is still his church. Yeah. Right? He can't take it because he takes Christ. He's part of Christ. He becomes flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. All of her ins and outs and unbeliefs and so forth and scruples as long as she's into that body and her ups and downs, the grace of God still holds her. And there she was, she said, as she laughed and said, why did Sarah laugh in the tent? What made Sarah laugh? What kind of telepathy is that? Behind him, the angel telling Abraham out there what Sarah was doing back behind him in the tent. Now, 
when that angel left, Abraham called him God. Right. Someone said to me not long ago, I said, Brother Brandon, you don't believe that that was actually God standing there eating a calf. I said, I sure do. Abraham called him Elohim. Right. Anyone knows that capital L-O-R-D, which is translated in the Greek, Elohim, which means the self-existing one. What was it going to show you? And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. What is it? Elohim. God. Appearing in human flesh. Hallelujah. Showing Christ. Jesus said in St. John 14, 12, The way he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Right. Now the church has come from the great reformation of the Lutheran age and then down to the Wesley age into the Pentecostal age and now shaping up like the headstone in the, the pyramid. Now I don't think I'm talking pyramid doctrine, but I'm just showing an example and how that has to fit so perfect in there because it, it's not a cement, it is just dropped in there. And how that there's a different word used, the appearing of Christ and the coming of Christ. It's two different words altogether. See, now Christ is appearing in these last days in his church, bringing his church together in unity, in faith, in power, in the word, all together, that when he returns, he'll find the same church. What the palm worm left the caterpillar eating, what the caterpillar left the locust eating, on down to the canker worm, but God said, I will restore said God. Romanism and so forth, eat that beautiful bride tree of Christ down to become a stump, but God brought right back out of that stump, right up to the Luther age, right up to the Wesley age, to the Pentecostal age, and now it's in the evening light. Yes. I will restore said the Lord all the years that the canker worm caterpillar. I will restore again that church in her beauty, that church in her power. And we see its evening lights coming. The Holy Spirit coming in so strong upon his church so the ministry of Jesus Christ and knowing amongst all of his people. They sat there with faith bringing him down. Powers and gifts working among them, speaking with tongues, interpretation of tongues and signs and wonders and miracles. What is it? Christ among his church getting ready to take her. In closing, I might say this, out on the sea that night to finish your testimony, we'll pre- start praying for the sick then. Out on the sea that night, fathers having this testimony meeting, they were having a great time, but they'd done something wrong. In all the excitement of their great revival they just had, they went off without him. Now I just wonder, brethren, with all good <laughs> if that isn't just about what's happened these last days. We've got new buildings, we've, we've built new things, we've increased our organizations, we've done everything else and put billions and billions of dollars out there and saying that Christ is coming right away. Why, well, people are too smart to know. They know better than that. Our, our, words, speak, our, words, speak louder than, uh, our words speak louder than our words, brother. That's right. We are just look like bad in the air. And there they was, it went off and they're all excited about the meeting and forgot to take him along. Then trouble set in. The devil must raise up behind them and say, aha, there they are in the big program. So this is the time for me to come in. Here he comes. Right down, begin to blow his old poison breath down. The days of miracles just past. It's all been a bunch of emotion and excitement. The waves begin to come and that devil sitting on every wave saying, we'll get him, we'll sink it. And the little old boat become waterlogged. The oars broken. The mast pole fell down. All the hopes is gone. Then the little boat rises up, filled full of water, and it soaked through, and now all hopes is gone. And But you know what? I'm, I'm so glad to say this to you now. When they left him, what did he do? He climbed the highest hill there was in the, in the country. Higher he got, the farther he could see. And he was watching them all the time. I believe he's done the same thing, don't you? Seen us in our mess. Yes. There he was in such a mess. And after a while when the storm and all hopes is gone, for another revival across the other country, they was going to get drowned before they got there. Here he come walking on the sea. 
walking right up to him. And the very after all that testimony meeting, they were still scared of him. They said it looks spooky. Yes, that's right. It might, he might be a spirit. When he left us, he climbed beyond Calvary. He went on beyond, he climbed past, climbed until he passed the sun, moon, and stars. As the brother outlaw church is saying the other night, said, past Jupiter, Venus, Neptune, and Mars. He climbed all his stripes the milky white way and went on into heaven and above heaven and went coming at all heavens. He's got a name above everything that's named up there. Yeah. Yeah. He has to look down and see heaven. And his eyes on the sparrow. And I know he's watching tonight, don't you? That's right. And he come walking to him on the water. The only thing that could help them, and they were afraid of it. Isn't that funny? The only thing that could help them, they were afraid of it. And so has it been now. The only thing that could help the people from communism, from all these things, the American people is scared of it. They say it looks spooky. It might be this or that. Don't do that. Why don't you invite him into the boat tonight and say, Come, Lord Jesus, and then the thing will calm down. Won't be long till we'll be at shore. Let's bow our heads just a moment now. Our Heavenly Father, such a crude little way of having to bring a message to an intelligent bunch of people, but I'm sure, Father, that you'll interpret it to them in the, in the, the attitude that it was meant in, that it will go in the meaning of love and fellowship and, and for faith to the people. And now, Father, we pray that you forgive us of all of our errors and mistakes. Pray that your Holy Spirit will come upon us now. We have said that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then the works that you did, the church would do also. We've also quoted your words, Lord. Heavens and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. And you said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now the Gentiles age is here. You're not a God that would feed part of your children one good food and leave it off the table for the others, because you're just, honorable, holy, no respect of persons. And when you gave the Jews their last sign, many of them recognized that that was what was spoke of. The Scripture said that would come to pass, and there it was. When he went to that little off-cast group of Samaritans, they believed it. The first thing happened, they believed it. And now here you are at the Gentile door. That was the closing of their age, and this is the closing of the Gentile age. God, we pray that all these people in here tonight that's gifted of the Holy Spirit will let their faith loose to God, and that God might use it to bring the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst tonight. We ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. I'm, don't know, I suppose we all close here real early, but we just, tomorrow night, we, we won't be this late. We just take a little time and call the, uh, the, prayer, the prayer line as much as we can get lined up, and uh, line them up and bring them up, and we'll pray for the sick. Now, uh, where is Billy? One, one to a hundred. He said he gave out from one up to a hundred prayer cards. All right, now just line them up just as we come. Now, no. One who has that prayer card. What's the letter? I, 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 I Indiana. I, I, all right. I, one, who has the prayer card. The lady, come out over here, lady. If you number two, if you'll just raise up your hand. Now, number two. Uh, if uh, help me, some oh, two. Thank you. Number three. Who has number three? All right, sir. Four. Good. Now that's right. That was your five. Five, help me, someone, if you will. Prayer card five, six, all right. All right, six, seven, eight. Who has number eight? I didn't see it. Is this the lady here? I bet she's a, that's it. All right, eight, nine, number nine. The lady there, number ten. All right, sir, eleven. I do this to keep them from running over one another, you know, and this is the house of God, not an arena, I see. Uh, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen. I don't see it. Fourteen. All right. Fifteen. Sixteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Seventeen. Maybe somebody's deaf now or somebody can't get up out of a chair or something. We'll go 
And we're going to pray for everybody that comes and wants to be prayed for. A little later on, we'll just this little introductory meeting tonight. We'll be getting a little long as we go on. What is that? About 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Well, well let's, there might be somebody, start, well, some going to step in and out. Uh, Billy said that they can't hear too good in the back. <clears throat> All right. I'd like to ask this, and let's wait just a minute. Now, one twenty. if they stepped out, put them right in the line, we start right on. All right. Now, how many in here does not have a prayer card? And you believe that, that you have enough faith to believe God will he's blessed to your hand. Everywhere now, it's just, all right, it's just all over. Now, while the ushers are taking care down there, I'd like to ask you this. Give you a scripture. If every one time you catch me out of this Bible, you come tell me. See? All right. Look, there was a woman one time that didn't have a prayer card. We'd say like that. It sound, that's my, hope it don't sound sacrilegious. But she had a blood issue, and she said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be made well. You remember the story? Yeah. Sure you do. All right. Then, um... Uh, she, she touched his garment now out. He couldn't have felt it naturally, literally, because the Palestinian garment's loose. It's a robe. And beneath that is the underneath garment. Keep the dust off her legs. And he'll never touch it. She just touched the bar of his garment. And even the Apostle Peter rebuked him, or rebuked uh, him when he said, Who touched me? He said, But I perceive that I've gotten weak. Virtue's gone from me. Now, how many of you believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? I watch this glorious bunch of pastors here now. Uh, brethren, doesn't the scripture teach us that he is a high priest right now? That can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Uh, How many out there believe he's a high priest that can be touched by the Now, if he's the same high priest, he'd act the same as he did then. Is that right? Now, how would you know he is acting? Now, here's what it is. I've just got through saying God is in his people. All that God was, he poured into Jesus. Do you believe that? Yes. He was a fullness of the Godhead bodily. And all Jesus was, he poured into the church. The Holy Ghost. Is that right? So it's God in us. God in you. It's not, it doesn't make you anything. It's not the holy mountain or the holy church. It's, it's the Holy Ghost. Not the holy people, the Holy Ghost. See? It's the Holy Ghost in the people. Not holy people, Holy Ghost. See? And that's the thing. And in this Holy Ghost has gifts. And the office gifts of the church is apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. Is that right? All for the edifying. You're setting together the church. Bring it into order. You, or the, tell me when you're ready. Okay. Bring it into order. Now I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me now, uh, if you will. If you just give us the rest of the audience I hope you can understand me real good now. Don't move around now. See, just sit real quiet. From this time on, don't move around, see, because it's under a, a discernment. And when you move your spirit, and you, you realize that you're a spirit, if you don't, you're dead. See, as long as your spirit and anointing of the spirit here, this Holy Spirit has contact with every spirit in here. How many knows that? Yeah. It's the prophet subject to this. So it's in contact. Then when you move, see it interrupts. See? Now there'll be this on the platform moving because I've got that person in contact. See? And then they're coming. And as soon as the Holy Spirit speaks with them, then you see, then others standing, something moving to this way. It wasn't the one that You see, you just don't know what to do then. You're just confused. So if you will, just for about 10 minutes to get to that line of 15. Now, before I do this, I'll ask you something. How many in this line of strangers can you raise up your hands? How many audience of strangers to me raise up your hands? But you know what? I don't know nothing about you. Just raise up your hands. I guess everybody here, as far as I can see, uh, I don't know no one. Don't know about two of these ministers up here on platform, two or three. And these by Brother Cop and him, I know them. But out in the audience, I don't see one person out there that I can recognize. They call their name at this time. But um, each one of you, God knows you. He knows right where you're sitting. 
to my way of seeing God, and he knows before the foundation of the world it should be sitting there. If he's infinite, sure, he's infinite, he knows everything. That's reading he tell the end from the beginning. He's infinite. Now, I hear, is this the, the patient there? Would you just come a little closer, lady? Now, here is exactly a Bible scene of St. John, the fourth chapter. Just while I got through speaking on one of the illustrations of the testimony, there's a white man, a colored woman. That was Jesus, the Jew, and a Samaritan woman. Exactly two races. And so uh, she tried to tell him that about this. It wasn't customary, but he told her uh, for one that, but he let her know that God made all people. Everybody, we're all come from Adam and Eve. That's the father and mother of all of us. All human beings. Where we raise a color changes, white, brown, black, yellow, whatever it was, has nothing to do with each one of us to give one another a blood transfusion. We're all God made of all nations one blood. Right. So that old thing was dead when Jesus came. That old fuss they had. You know, know that God was a God of Samaritans, just the same as He was with the Jew. The Father was seeking such that would worship him in spirit and truth, no matter what they were. Peter said on, out there, he said, the house, I perceive that God no respect of no nation, but all those who fear him. That's right. All up on. Well, here's exactly St. John 4. We're strangers to each other. Now, this should settle it. Let me tell you, I'm your brother. I'm Brother Branham, your brother. But I'm not a preacher, which you know I... Uh, I'd like to be, but I don't have enough education to be called myself a preacher. But this is my ministry, that he gave me a gift. And that gift is to shake the church, to bring it to a recognition of the coming of Christ. Yes. The return of the Spirit of God in the church. It's on you. The same Spirit. It might not be the same gift, but the same Spirit. Uh, different manifestations, but the same Spirit all the time. The same Holy Ghost you got, the same Holy Ghost I got. The same Holy Ghost we all got. It's all the children of God. And then while we come together spiritually now, then that Holy Spirit is there, and if diseases is, and the children come around where that Spirit is, it, it detects them. And it can detect you. It's uh, like a, a gift of prophecy, or not a gift of prophecy. I don't know. Just, just say it's Christ, you see, coming down among us. So as you go to tucking some kind of name on something, you've got yourself all messed up. So let's just say our Lord Jesus Christ is in the midst of us. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just all say right. Now, we're standing here talking to this woman. I don't know her, never see her. She looks plenty healthy. She might, she might have domestic trouble, financial trouble. She might be an impersonator. I, she might be a Christian. She might be a sinner. I don't know her. She just come there. But whatever he tells her, she'll know whether it's the truth or not. Yeah. She'll be willing to admit that. Amen. Well, if he can tell her what has been, like he told Philip, like he told Nathaniel, like he told the woman at the well, all right. if he tells her what was, surely she can believe for the future then. Is that right? Yeah. So, will you all believe it if he'll do it? Yeah. Now, here we are. Here's the Bible. Here's the woman. And here we are standing right here before you all with our hands up that we've never met before, know not one another, and we're a different race of people. She's a, uh, I'm a Anglo-Saxon and she's an African. Now here we are. Just as perfect as it can be. Now, sisters, just to contact you. The reason I called you sister because when I looked around, the Spirit caught me and I know you're a Christian. Right. You're a Christian. Now, I do not know you. Now, I'm just standing here. You know I'm doing something. I'm just contacting your spirit, getting it started from around these other people, just drawing you out as one person. Now, if Christ can use me as a gift, now, he might put his anointing upon me. He's got to put it upon you at the same time, or it won't work. It takes both of us to make it work. The woman touched his garment. Jesus didn't know who did it, but he said, I perceive that virtue's gone from him. See, it wasn't him. He said, thy faith has saved it. See, it was her faith. Now, I don't know you, but if he'll tell you something about your life, maybe something you're here for, somebody you're for, something you've done that's wrong, or anything like that, you'll know where it's the truth or not. And then you will believe it. May the Lord God grant it. It's my request. Now, I see what a place it puts me in. Here's the time now that what I've preached and told about him, it must react 
or either I told something wrong, the Bible told something wrong, Christ is alive, or it's either our religion is right or it's wrong. It's got to be shown right now. Must always find much of man here. Here's the ministers of Christ sitting here. We so I stood before hundreds of thousands that couldn't even speak their language and see this thing that take place. Poor heathens, witch doctors, and what they call holy men of India, and fire walkers, and everything else, and see the power of God come down here. But he's Christ. If he isn't, I want to know where he's at. I want to find him. Yes, a woman not a hypocritical. She's standing here for a cause, and that cause it must. She's actually. According to a doctor, is supposed to face an operation, and he's right. And that operation is tumor. Amen. That's right. If that's right, raise up your hand. Amen. Now, do you believe that he knows where the tumor Amen. is? You believe he can tell me? You believe me? Yeah, I believe you. It's on the breast. Amen. It's on your left breast. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. All right. Amen. Go believe it now, and you'll never have to have the operation. If you believe with all your heart, God will take it away from you. How do you do, young lady? We are strangers to each other, I suppose. Just a man and woman, me. But Jesus Christ knows both of us. He knows all about you. He knows all about me. I'm just his servant. And do you believe that he is here to reveal to me uh, something about you? Would it cause you to have faith in him to know that he's, he's here? Would you accept whatever you're asking for? Which you would do it. That man sitting there has a hand up to his chin like this, sitting right here, sitting there praying about a nervous condition. Just believe with all your heart the nervousness is gone from you now. now is that true? Raise up your hand. Right. Now I want to ask you what he touched. He had faith to bring the Holy Spirit from here out to the man. I've never seen him in my life. He's a stranger to me as far as I know. But he had faith. That's what it takes. Faith to do it. Just believe it. I just watch a light. You, you ever see a picture of it? See, they got it here. We'll have it. It was, went across this way from him, went out. I see him standing over the man there. Just had this faith. Now, there's the man sitting there, just the man sitting in the meeting. Now you're sick. You've been to a doctor. You've had some advice from him. But you're scared of his advice. Right. That's true. Nothing evil is right. It's a lady's trouble. That's what's wrong with you. I can see him when the examination, what he said, is it all right for me to say what it is? You want me to tell you what it is? Actually, it's somewhere, it's a misplaced seed, germ, and it's been caught in what's the tube, instead of coming down into the ovary, it's called pregnating tube, and he wants to operate, and you're afraid of the operation. If that's right, raise up your hand. Uh, Beatrice, <laughs> you want to be made well? Go believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Believe on the Lord Jesus and what the, all the Bible prophesied that would come to pass? A man, we're strangers to each other. You believe the Lord Jesus is here to help you? <clears throat> You believe if he will reveal to me what you're wanting from him, that it'll be granted to you? You do. You've seen a woman come. Sitting right down here looking at me, suffering with high, high blood pressure. The glasses on, combed your hair back. There she comes. Don't you see that light hanging above the woman there? Look. Raise up your hand, lady. There you are. You believe with all your heart now? Then go home and get well. 
I do not know the lady. I've never seen her in my life. She's a stranger to me. That's your trouble. You have had faith enough to touch the garment of him to turn around like that. Well, you couldn't disbelieve it, could you? You're going to have your healing. Then. I want to ask you, what could she touch out there? She's, I guess, 30 feet from me. She, did, she isn't touching me. She's touching him. Amen. That's right. If she touched him, and he just spoke back, you see. Uh, if the church would ever wake up to that and realize what that is. All right. Here ever now, don't be afraid. Be not afraid. It is I. <laughs> it's the Lord Jesus. You know it isn't me, cause and it's got to be some spirit and power. So whatever you think it is, to me it's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, confirming exactly what He said. Now, sir, not knowing you and we being strangers with each other, if the Lord Jesus will reveal something about you, or something you're wanting, or something you're wanting for somebody else, or whatever the case may be, you'll believe him more. Mm-hmm. You're up for an operation. should have another operation, because you've had one. And that operation was for a kidney stones, and you're back again. That's a, a chemical condition of your body which is causing that, and that's the only thing you can call, ever be is for God to remove the chemical part of your body that, that's causing this interruption, or at least that's what the specialist says. Okay. Huh. Your wife's standing right down there in the prayer, huh? huh. For the, want the kidney trouble, too? How about you just turn around and go down there and lay your hands on your wife and pray in for her? <laughs> you agree with all your heart? The Lord Jesus will, will perform and do and grant and make it, make it well? Our Heavenly Father, as they lay hands on each other, I condemn the devil has done it, and they both be healed and go home and be well for the kingdom of God. Grant it, Father, in the name of Jesus. All right, don't doubt in your heart now. Believe with all your heart. Step out of the line, sister, and go right with him. Go home and forget about ever having it and get well. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe that he's here now. I believe he's the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the morning star. I believe that he's here today, appearing in among the people, showing to them that the end is nigh, and the soon he's coming to catch away a church. And the ministry of his ministers are shaping right into his own ministry that he have here on earth to catch away the entire church. I believe it with all my heart. All right. Now, please, uh, try to, I'm, I've run over my time. I'm sorry. Let's have this one woman here, then. Would you just, just a minute? How do you do, sister? She's up here, so I think she needs to be prayed for. Or I'll pray for the rest of them, but I mean to you for uh, discernment, or what we would call it, to see whatever it is. Do you believe me to be his servant? With all your heart? Your trouble's in your chest. That's right. But to keep seeing somebody else that's here, and it's your husband. He's not here. But you had him on your mind, and you're praying for him. That's right. You believe God can tell me what his trouble is? Then he's back. That's right, isn't it? Uh, you believe you're going to go and find him all right? All right, then just go right on right up. You believe it all your heart, and you'll find it just the way you believe. Now, if you don't doubt it, you'll find it just that way. Do you believe with all your heart? Sister, do you believe God can heal arthritis and make a person well? Just keep on going to Now, do you believe the same thing? That nervousness and arthritis will leave and you'll be made well? Look this way as you come, sister. You know, God can heal heart trouble. It seems to heal anything else. Don't you believe that? You believe with all your heart? And raise up your hand and say, I accept it. Go right on your road and Jesus yeah. Christ in the name of the Lord. Don't yeah. oh, believe me. All right? Man is crippled by some. Come this way, sir. I see you're crippled up. 
Look at me and believe. Will you believe it? All right. If you'll believe it, all the arthritis will leave you. You'll go home and be well. You believe you'll do that? And if you do, just keep on walking through the same. Praise God. Don't lay hands on you if you pass by. Come on, say, thank you. Say, thanks and praise be to God. And believe with all your heart. Amen. I want to ask you something. With that precious book under your arm, what if I just laid my hands up on you? Would you believe to get well? And in the name of Jesus Christ, go and get well. All right. Come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What do you think, sister? That old nervous spell has been bothering you. You believe it will leave now? As you pass under the shadow of the cross, full of rejoicing, it will never bother you. Look this way, sir. You have many things bother you, like prostrate and so forth, but your main thing is heart trouble. Go on your own and say, I'm healed in the name of the Lord. Just believe with all your heart. Look this way, lady. You believe your back trouble will get all right and you go home and be well? All right, just keep walking. Thank you, God. We just thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ. The lady has the lady's trouble. And also, I see she's bothered smothering in her heart. So I'm not a bad to say, I believe with all my heart. I'm going home and sort of quit bothering and I'm going to be all right. Hey, 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 Thanks be to God. Amen. Here's the to our Lord Jesus Christ. Here comes a man that looks like you already have faith. What if he has passed by and lay hands on you? The Bible says these signs will follow them to believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they'll get well. Do you believe it? Come right by then. Hey, Nervousness, arthritis, weakness, cramps, and heart trouble. Do you believe with all your heart you're going to get well now? You just go right on the road, just rejoice and stand, thank you to God, and God will give you the victory. Do you believe with all your heart? All right, somebody else coming now? All right. You going to believe? What if I just laid my hands on you didn't say nothing? You know I know what's going on. What if I just laid my hands on you? Would you think? When you shouted out there a few minutes ago, I told you it left you, would you believe it? All right. All right. Bring this way. What do you think, sister, as you come? You believe it here? If I said anything or didn't say anything, you'd get well anyhow. Would you believe that anyhow if I just lay? There's some kind of a spirit here. You know that. You believe it's the spirit of the Lord that's on us? You do? Then you're back. Co- well, I've done told you anyhow, so go on. Go on. Believe with all your heart. How many believes out there with all your heart now? Do you believe? He's God. Do you believe that? He's God on the house top. He's God in the church. He's God in the church. He's God everywhere. He's God. I thought that light was following a lady, but it was that colored lady sitting there. You. Yeah. You believe me to be his prophet or his servant? That colored lady sitting there with a white hat on, white looking at You believe God can tell me while you're in contact with his spirit? What's wrong with you? Would you accept it? Then your bladder trouble won't bother you no more. Will you, do, will you do me a favor now? Lay your hands over on the lady sitting next to you because she's bothered with her eyes. That's right. Lay your hands on her. All right? Will you do me a favor next? The lady sitting next to you is bothered with a diarrhea. Dys- dysentery. Diarrhea. That's right. Raise up your hand. Put your hand over on her. Ask that if she'll be made well. What about the lady sitting next to her? Do you believe with all your heart, lady? Your trouble's in your side, your right side. Believe with all your heart, it'll leave you. You do it? What about the lady sitting next to her? Do you believe with all your heart? You have smothering spells. Can't get your breath right. You will now, because you got Do you believe with all your heart? Lay your hands over on one another now. Now. For the sake of those who are sitting by you, are you a believer? Raise up your hand, if you're a believer. Now lay that believing hand over on somebody else. Here's what God said. He said this, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. The Holy Spirit's out there. 
just the same as he's up here, and he's man, he's everywhere. Do you believe it? Then you pray for the person you got your hand on. Lay your hand over on him and pray now. Pray for the person. Heavenly Father, we bring to you this audience of believers, thanking you that your presence is here with us. We don't only see you, dear, but we see you working among your people, confirming your word with signs following. Now there's many sick in the audience. The hours are late. But Lord God, the great omnipotent God, I pray that you'll hear the prayer of your servant. And as these believing people have their hands on one another, praying a prayer of faith, and you said the prayer of faith shall save the sick, God shall raise them up. Father, what a group of unbelievers it would make us if we disbelieve your presence here with us now. And after we feel you, see your word, preach your word, see your word operate through all of us here in the building, feeling your presence, knowing you're here, and now we're obeying your commandments as believers to lay hands on each other as the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, Lord, hear my prayer. I lay my prayer upon the altar. I lay my faith up there with them. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we go to meet the devil in his challenge of unbelief. Come out, Satan, from these people. Leave them alone. We charge thee by the living God, in the name of Jesus Christ, to leave the people and come out of them that they be made well. All you that believe that a believer has his hands on you, and you believe that the presence of Christ is here now, if you're not scared, if you're afraid and say, oh, I don't know, then your little boat might sink. But if you can hear him saying in his message, be not afraid, it's I. Jesus Christ, the very confirmation of the Bible made known. There's enough faith right here now if you were just was afraid. Seems like something wants to hold you back. Yes. That you say, oh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I've been in meetings before. See, I know just exactly what you're thinking. It ain't me. It's him telling me. Amen. If you will do this, remember I said as a minister, as your brother, if you just let all those thoughts sail aside and know that a believer has laid their hands on you. And Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And if Abraham, our father, believed God for 25 years for a promise, how much more ought the royal seed of Abraham to believe God's promise? Do you accept it? Do you believe it? And if you believe it's the truth, make a testimony to God. Stand up to your feet and a testimony that I now accept my healing. I believe that I'm healed because I'm in the presence of God and a believer has laid his hands upon me. Praise be to God who gives us the victory. Amen.